Okay, excellent. Okay, so lecture 15, welcome to Bioscience. Uh, today we will have a very interesting topic and we will talk about bacteria, specific actions of the, uh, I mean, what are the diseases that uh, important bacteria are going to cause in human body, okay? How is it going to happen? Uh, I want you to, uh, per, per, first of all, tell me one thing. Uh, infection that we already learned in the previous is the same to say inflammation, yes or no? Somebody? Infection. Infection is the same to say inflammation? Yes, I think okay. yes. All right, so who else? Yeah. Okay. In All right. Invasion, infect, inflammation. If, okay, so it's kind of uh, similar, right? Or some people use it as the same. Now you are going to be able to differentiate what is an inflammatory process versus an infection, okay? So everybody knows that infection, we talked in previous class, are going to be what? Infection, invasion, right? Invasion, infection, right? So the infection is going to start with an invasion. So what is the invasion? It's going to enter into your body, number one, right? Second is going to grow. Third is going to reproduce. And fourth, they are going to spread out all your body, right? Remember the bacteria's average are going to multiply every 20 minutes, right? So every 20 minutes we have duplicating the number of bacteria. So the conclusion about that is you to know that the earlier you detect the infection, actually the best result. In this case, is we call prognosis, the best prognosis. When you say prognosis, basically it's the, the word that we use and say, what are the results? What is the outcome, right? The prognosis, right? So just to, uh, just to get familiar with some words, okay? All right, so what, but what is inflammation? All right, so uh, Marilyn, do you cut your finger once? with needle or something? Yeah. No? Yes? Yeah, right. Yeah. Everybody, right? Some flowers or whatever, it's spikes, whatever, you, you pinch your finger and you start to be in pain, correct? Correct? Okay. Yes. So tell me, that was infected? Do you have antibiotics after that, after you pinch that, that finger? It's just resolved by itself, right? Yes or no? Yeah, I don't take anything. Exactly, right? And that is basically a, an inflammatory process. Inflammatory process, right? So bacteria is going to be present there, but it's going to be controlled by the immune system of the body. But infection, infection is the invasion. It's going to cross all the barriers, are going to start invading, uh, 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 finding the portal of entry to the body, growing, reproducing, and spreading out. Inflammation is a different situation, and I'm going to explain you that. Tell me, do you do you need do we need inflammation? Yes, we need inflammation, right? When we are talking about invasion of bacteria, viruses, or fungus, we need inflammation. All right, I, I'm going to make the chart right now. Okay, so then give me. I want a. a a black. Uh... Okay, excellent. All right, so here we have inflammation. Inflammation. The inflammation. Inflammation. Inflammation is coming from the word what? What? What is telling you the word inflammation? What word is coming to your mind? And flame swelling. Swelling. What about flame? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Right? Flame, right? Heat, right? All right. So tell me, Marilyn. So when you was heating or you pinch your finger, what do you feel? Like a pinch. 
Okay, that is pain, correct? Yeah. Number two, what is going to look like? Red or no? Red, yeah. Right. What else? Is going to get swollen? Yes or no? Yes. Lima, right? And tell me, do you feel some increase of temperature in your in 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 that area? You feel like a little bit hot in that area? Yes or no? Yes. Right. Okay. And number five is going to be the loss of the function that we are going to explain in the in a few moments. All right. So these are what I call the table of five. Table of five. You just talk to the students on previous or modules, and that I'm very rigorous on this. So this is something that you must know. The inflammation process that is going to help you to understand many things. So I'm going to go to the point. Look at this. When you pinch your finger, basically what you have is an inflammation. Is an inflammation. It's not an infection. That is going to be controlled by your body. Now, if you have a big injury or you don't take care of that uh, wound in your finger, inflammation can progress into actually the uh, the infection. Do you agree with that? So that means that if you have inflammation, that doesn't mean necessary an infection. Okay, because the conditions to be called an infection is reproducing, multiplying, I mean, growing, reproducing, and spreading out. And in this case, it's not that spreading out. They are not spreading out. They are going to be focal, localized. So if you have an inflammation, that doesn't mean that it's an infection, but they can lead into infection. So in other words, inflammation can resolve by itself. And period is inflammation. They don't progress to change name to any other thing. Inflammation ends inflammation, inflammation is resolved. But when you have an infection, when you have an infection, previously always you have an inflammatory process. You okay with that? Yeah. Everybody getting getting clear on that? Yes. Okay, so so now you can tell that infection and inflammation are two different things. Okay, inflammation is going to be a process that I'm going to explain. I didn't start to explain that yet. So what is that inflammation? Tell me one thing. When you uh, you have a plastic, uh, you have a plastic, Marilyn, Marilyn, you have a plastic and put some heat on the plastic. What happened with the plastic? They are going to distend. I guess it's going to melt, right? So let's put it this way. You have a balloon, balloon with air, and you put some heat, not so close, but in, in order to make the air inside to make it more uh, warm. What happened? The balloon is going to distend, yes or no, right? So when you apply heat to any structure, the structure are going to, burst, first of all, before they melt, <laughs> right? They're going to distend. They are going to make it, more uh, uh, dilation of uh, of the object. Are you okay with that or no? Are you okay with that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what happened is this. All right. So this is what is become serious. Okay. Are you ready? Let's get. I'm going to go over and over because I want to be sure that you have this. All right. So tell me, what is this? That a membrane? The cell membrane. Correct. The cell membrane. Okay? The cell membrane. Now, here we have a, need, a needle. Let's make a needle. A needle that is going to hurt your, uh, your skin and they're going to hurt some cells. So when you hit your skin, the cells are being destroyed. Yes or no? Right? Some cells are being destroyed. Okay? So this injury, this injury... It could be mechanical, chemical, whatever you want, injury. So what is going to happen? What is going to happen that these cells are going to react uh, with this injury with histamine, histamine, histamine. Uh, all right, so I'm going to put here, are going to release histamine, 
histamine. Histamine. Hist this histamine they can go out of the cell, right? So the cell is being destroyed. So what is doing this histamine? What is doing this histamine? This histamine is going to activate other cells to produce actually what we call the prostaglandins. Prostaglandins. Okay, prostaglandins. So histamine, we have bradykinin, we have many others, right? But histamine is going to be the substance when you have an injury or when you have, for example, tell me, when you are sneezing, when you have an allergy for pollen, you're releasing a lot of histamine. And that is basically allergies, correct? Yes. Yeah, proof of that, of that inflammation. Oh, I'm inflamed. I need to have, I have congestion. I, I need to help me to prevent the allergies with histamine. And what you do, you go to Safeway, you go to CVS, and you buy what? Antihistaminics. That is where it's coming, the antihistaminics for. We okay with that? Yes. Okay. So this histamine that is going to activate the prostaglandins that are located in the cell membrane of the cells. They are going to be located in all the cells of the body all the cells of your, whatever is injured, whatever is going to to uh, to damage some cells, all the cells are having the same response. They are going to release prostaglandins. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about inflammation just to make it more easy. Inflammation, inflammation, I told you, flame, distension, dilation of an object, right? So the vessels are like this at the beginning, like that. That is a normal, after the injury, what happened with the vessel? The vessels are going to produce a vasodilation, 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 BSD. So what is this doing vasodilation? What for do we need vasodilation? Inflammation histamine produce vasodilation, vasodilation. Why you have actually a vasodilation because when you have an injury here bacteria are start to try to get invading in your body and what happened you're going to have a vasodilation to bring more blood to the area more blood more blood so why it's important to bring more blood because the more blood are going to bring more soldiers which are those soldiers are the white cells the white cells so that's why we want to, we have this vasodilation. It's going to be like a highway, very narrow. Now the highway is very broad, very, very wide. So there's more space for more soldiers coming into the area of fight. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And your, this is a vasodilation, vasodilation. And then what happened? So this vasodilation, because they are going to uh, increase in diameter, they are getting closer to the surface of the skin. They're getting closer to the surface of the skin. So they are, if they, if this, the, the, my screen is this diameter of the vessel. The vessel now is going to vasodilate. They vasodilate. And see, here, here on the top, on the top is the skin. This is the skin. Here is the vessel. The vessel now is going to vasodilate, it's going to become like this. So can you see the vessel getting closer to the skin? Because the base, the, the artery or the vessel is more dilated. So that's why you can see redness. You got it? That's why you can see redness. So you see the redness because the we have an inflammation. So tell me, do you twist your, your foot, your hand? Do you cut your skin or something? You have an inflammation process, yes or no, around the cut. Yeah. It's not red. It's because of the vasodilation that is going to bring white cells to fight with the bacteria trying to attack you. And the vessels are getting closer, or closer to the surface of the skin. So that's why you see the redness. You okay with that? Now, this increase of circulation or with the vasodilation is going to 
produce an increase of temperature as well because there is more activity, it's more activity. And you know, the heat, the heat is caused by, by some substances, I'm not going to mention that, the bradykinins, etc., cetera, uh, TN factor, whatever. So there's other substances after the cells are being damaged where they are going to increase the temperature, trying to increase the temperature. And why? Because the temperature is going to help to even vasodilate more the vessels. So, so far that we have is redness, redness, and we have actually a, a heat, correct? Now, why get swollen? Why it gets swollen? It gets swollen because a simple reason. Look at this, look at this, look at that, don't miss it. So here we have a normal vessel. Now the vessel is vasodilated, vasodilated. So when that happened, the permeability, the permeability of water increase. So water start to escape. When you have vasodilation, these, the spaces that are, it's like you're stretching out the vessel. And, uh, and there is a small space between cell to cells. And that is going to be a little bit more bigger where the a small molecules of water can go and escape from the vessel outside into the tissue. So the, the, the water starts to accumulate around this injury or these vessels, and that is going to produce swelling, swelling accumulation of fluid. So that means what we call edema. You okay with that? Yep. So we have already explaining how happened the edema, how is happening the how is happening the uh, heat, how is happening the redness, the redness. Okay. Now we are going to explain the pain in a few moments. So those are the the cardinal signs of inflammation. So please, I want you to write down this. All these guys are going to be called the cardinal cardinal signs of inflammation, inflammation. Cardinal is not an English word, you know, it's an Italian word. So in medicine, we need to use many Latin, French, Italian words. So cardinal is one of those. What means cardinal? Cardinal means a specific, unique, uh, special, right? Unique, in this case, what does it mean? Cardinal, cardinal sign. When you eat something that you can apply in other situations too. For example, when you go to a restaurant, you said, oh, this is a car bocato cardinale. Cardinale means basically a very delicious food, for example, other applications, right? But cardinal here is the main signs and symptoms of, uh, of inflammation. All right, so we already explained the redness. We already explained the swelling. We already explained the heat. We are going to explain about the pain. Talking about the pain, and that is, uh, you know, you're in the in medical field. You need to deal with pain all the time, correct? So you better pay. We better pay attention to this because it's very important. That is going to be applicable for med search for pharmacology one and two. So please, just I'm sitting. I put in the basis, okay? All right. So prostaglandin, 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 and then we are going to do a recap. The prostaglandin sounds like a prostate, right? Sounds like a prostate. Why? Because the first time they found these substances, this substance was in the prostate. And they were thinking the prostate is the one who produced, is the center of pain. And so on. But later on, sooner, they found out that these prostaglandins are found in every single cell of your body. Every single cell. How many cells we have? 100 trillion cells of in our body. All cells from head to toe, all of them, they have prostaglandins. Where are located these prostaglandins? Are going to be located in the, I'm going to put a more center here, in the cell membrane, cell membrane, cell membrane. I'm going to draw here the cell membrane, cell membrane, cell membrane, cell membrane, cell membrane. So in all these prostaglandins are going to be formed from the cell membrane. That is where they're going to form. How they are going to be formed? When they get histamine, 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 this histamine is going to activate the phospholipids, phospholipids. 
is going to activate phospholipids, you know, the main components of the cell membrane, phospholipid and protein, right? So this histamine is going to interact with the phospholipid, activating an enzyme called the phospholipase. The phospholipase. The phospholipase. This phospholipase, this phospholipase are going to be, uh, uh, histamine plus phospholipids are going to be activated activating the phospholipase. The phospholipase, what are doing is to produce, question for the exam, the arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid. Okay? This arachidonic acid then is going to produce, I'm not going to talk about leukotrienes now, but I'm going to talk about the prostaglandins. 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 These prostaglandins, what are those? What is, in few words, prostaglandins? Never forget that. Prostaglandins are going to be local messengers. Local messengers. Local messengers. What are prostaglandins, everybody, please? Local? Local, local messengers. Messenger. Don't forget ever. Okay, put the stickers in your hand, in your, in, in your bathroom, whatever. But remember that. What is a prostaglandin? It's a local messenger. Now, local messenger for what? They are going to send messages for what? They are going to send messages for, number one, for pain. Pain, pain, pain. Prostaglandins are going to send a local messenger for inflammation. Inflammation. Prostaglandins are going to send messages for, local messages to, for, produce clot. Clotting. Clot. Clots, right? Clot. And the other one are mucus. All right, so how many functions we have for the We have at least a couple or dozen of activities. So I just want you to remember four of them. Four of them. They're going to be very much used in the, in the next courses. Okay? Local message for pain. So you pinch your finger. You have pain. Who is doing that? The prostaglandin. You are pinching your... your uh, 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 hurt your finger inflammation who's doing that the prostaglandin local messenger tell me one thing uh, homework if you pinch your your finger with a needle and you will see blood coming up and watch your blood you're going to bleed until you die no the blood is going to get clot yes or no yes right it's going to stop right so the the bleeding is going to stop and who is doing that the prostaglandin nice or no Mucus, we are going to talk about another time, but basically I want you to remember four of them. Mucus is related to the stomach. That is uh, probably going to mention a little bit now. All right, so now, how we apply these prostaglandins? Tell me, uh, Marilyn, when you have pain, what you do, what you you what is the first thing coming into your mind? What how to calm out, down the pain? What you're going to do? I'll put pressure on it. Okay, pressure on it. Okay. All right. So, but as as a treatment, how you you have too much pain. You you twist your your foot, your ankle. So you have pain. So what you're going to do? Put an ice pack. Uh, yeah, take some analgesic, right? Yes or no? You can take, for example, ibuprofen, right? The Motrin, Advil, yeah? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And you know what is doing that that guy? What you are taking, when you're taking ibuprofen, ibuprofen, Advil, or Motrin, what they are doing is to cut the production of the local messenger for pain. From where? From the prostaglandins. So that is the action of the, of the ibuprofen. So when you take some analgesic, the analgesic is going to calm down the pain. Why? Because they are going to block the local messengers of prostaglandins that produce pain. They are going to, oh, I have inflammation. You twist your foot, your feet, or your wrist, your hand, your finger. So you take an anti-inflammatory, right? You take a albuprofen, or you can take a, actually naproxen, or you can take aspirin. So those are going to be anti-inflammatories. So inflammation is going to improve, yes. Why? Because these medications are going to block the local messenger for inflammation. You okay with that? Yeah. Yes. 
Okay? So now, I want you to remind yourself, see yourself at the very beginning. Inflammation is the same to say infection? Very different, right? You got it? Yeah. Okay. Any questions so far? It's about no? how they block the local messengers. Like, how does an no. anti inflammatory respond? That is what, local yeah. Messengers? So, when you when you take NSAIDs, you take uh, ibuprofen. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to talk, say NSAID because your uh, your group is not at that level yet, right? So, the, the, what I'm saying is ibuprofen is a painkiller, right? So, it's going to uh, uh, cut the pain. Why? Because the ibuprofen is going to block the local messengers for pain. So prostaglandins, and the prostaglandins uh, are local messengers for pain, one of the functions, and that is going to be blocked by the, by the, uh, and the, uh, for the ibuprofen. So there is no local messengers for pain. So they are not going to show pain and they are going to diminish the pain. Okay, so I think it's clear or no, it's not clear. So tell me yes. everybody, please. See, yes, means oh, oh. Erin. Yes. Miss uh, Marilyn, we okay with that? Yeah. Marcel, you okay? Any question? No question. Okay, all right. So uh, now, let's go back to the cardinal signs. This is question for the exam. So I can make it in different colors, flavors, whatever, but you need to know the concept, okay? So these are the cardinal signs of inflammation. Cardinal signs of inflammation oh inflammation pain redness edema heat now the loss of the function let's explain this in this moment okay all right loss of function tell me do you know somebody who has uh, uh rheumatoid arthritis do you know somebody okay you know that a, a person who is having rheumatoid arthritis suffering just few months the appearance of the joints are going to be different when the person is having already after 30 years of having the same problem right so there's some deformities right even and in, in the long run do you know that right do you know that for example one thing so the hands in rheumatoid arthritis are going to have deviations here we call cubital deviation so they are going to do this do you see hands like that when you're rheumatoid arthritis? So why is that? Because there is a malformation, a deformation of the bones already. Okay? And that is what the rheumatoid arthritis, itis. What means itis? Everybody, what is itis? Inflammation. Inflammation. There you are, right? So cystitis, urethritis, pielonephritis, glomerulonephritis, uh, myositis, Neuritis, inflammation, all this is going to play the role of inflammation. We okay with that? Okay. So now, if you see here, if you touch, if you let's make a rheumatoid arthritis on the knee, on the knee, on the knees. So you see the knees, it's swollen, it's red, it's heat, it's hot, and it's, it's red, it's swollen. Yes or no? And painful, correct? Correct. That is inflammation of the articulation, right? But then what happened? You take the medications and all that, and after 20, 30 years of having the same problem, there's going to be some changes on the anatomy of the joint. And what happened to the patient? The patient is going to walk as when they was 20, 30, 50 years old. No, now he's having 80 years old, and the patient is limping on that knee. And what does it mean? That means that is the loss of the function. You are losing the function of the knee. So that is happening in the long run. In the long run. You okay with that? All right, let's make another example just to convince you. You want me to convince you? I am going to convince you. Let's actually take alcohol every day. Every day. Every day. Let's get drunk all, all the time. Every day. All right? And one day we get drunk. One week we get drunk, three day, uh, three weeks, three months, one year, five years, ten years, every day for twenty five years. Right. So what happened? 
your liver is going to be totally destroyed, right? So when you take alcohol, you are actually making an inflammation of the liver. Inflammation of the liver. When you have this inflammation of the liver, of obviously you don't see uh, you don't see the the heat uh, or the redness because it's in inside your body, right? But pain is going to appear. And what happened when you have inflammation? And please remember this forever. When you have inflammation, are already cells who are being destroyed. When you have any inflammation, cells are being destroyed. Cells are being destroyed already. So what is doing the body? The body is trying to replace the cells who are being destroyed. Correct. So when you take alcohol, you have an inflammation. Basically, you have hepatitis. And please. I don't want you to think hepatitis is just virus, hepatitis A, B, C, D, uh, E, and F, and G is not discovered yet, but hepatitis is not just viruses. Huh? But you can have, for example, alcohol, and you have inflammation of the liver. That is hepatitis. You 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 eat these uh, mushrooms, that not uh, toxic mushrooms, not all mushrooms are good, right? You can have, actually, toxicity in the liver. When you have too much medication, you can have toxicity, inflammation of the liver. So anything, somebody want to kill themselves just drinking Windex. Do you think they're going to die like that? No, they're going to destroy the liver and that and the death is going to be a slow and long time. So they need to find somewhere else, somewhere, another, another way. So there is many things that can produce inflammation of the liver, hepatitis. In this case, we have the alcohol. So what happened with this? the alcohol are going to produce inflammation of the liver and remember please inflammation causes destruction of the cells so the liver need to replace the cells who are being damaged and there is a moment that all it's like i will tell you something look at that cut your skin here one time all right so okay wait a week two weeks it's healing all right i want you to cut it in the same place exactly Okay, the second time will be healing, but you do three, four times. The fifth time, by sure, you're going to have no skin. You're going to be replaced by a scar tissue. Yes or no? You will have a scar. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Right? So the same happened with the liver. The liver is going to be inflamed, 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 and the liver starts to regenerate, regenerate, reset. Oh, my God, I'm tired of this. So instead to have new liver cells, you're going to replace by, by a scar tissue. And how, when you have a massive uh, uh, scar tissue uh, form in the liver, what is that called? That is called cirrhosis. Okay, and cancers, and we are going to talk another time. Okay, but that is telling you, don't lose the perspective, please. Then let's go back. So you have an inflammation in the long run, you're going to lose the function of the organ. Yes or no? So if you replace the liver by a scar tissue, a scar tissue is not a functional cell. The scar tissue is not liver cells, are not liver cells. So you, little by little, you are losing the function of the liver. So in conclusion, before we go to the break, you're going to have the cardinal signs of inflammation. The cardinal signs of inflammation will be pain, swollen, or edema, heat, redness, and number five are going to be the loss of the function. So the cardinal signs of inflammation, like the fingers of your hand. Look at my hand, five fingers, five signs. You okay with that? Yeah. So when you are talking about anti-inflammatory, when you're talking anti-inflammatory, what you're doing? You are treating the pain, the redness, the swelling, right? The edema, uh, I mean, the heat, right? So heat is okay, right? Edema is resolved. The pain is resolved. Redness, we don't care that much. But basically, that are the five cardinal signs of inflammation. So nowadays, when you hit your finger, when you injure your, whatever part of your body, you have inflammation. So you need to take anti-inflammatories. What is that? Is the actually ibuprofen, naproxen, aspirin, sulindac, meloxicam, many others. 
many others, right? That is what you need to remember at this moment. Okay, so I hope I changed your mind, uh, your your perception and your vision about what is differentiate between inflammation and infection. One more last example. Uh, I hope don't, don't, don't do that. You twist your finger going down the stairs. You have pain and your your knee and your uh, ankle become um, are actually become swollen, right? That is what you have is inflammation. Is that an infection? Yes or no? No at all. No. Yeah. You got it? You got it? Yep. And when you have, but, but when you have an infection, always previous to that, there is, there is an inflammation. Inflammation don't necessarily progress into infection. You okay with that? All right. So I will see you uh, in 10 minutes, 11.22. Okay, any question? None here. No. Okay, so now we, for this, we need to keep going because it's a lot of material. Okay, all right. So see, we'll just, oh, you want lunch break or you in order to, lunch break is okay? No? Or 10 minutes? I'm good with just a 10 minute break. Okay, let's do it. All right, uh, 11.22. See you then. Thank you.
Hello. Uh, I don't see. Just a moment. Let me check something. Okay. All right, so let's continue. So in recap, recap here, please. So when you have a uh, injury, you need to look for inflammation, right? Inflammation means the production of prostaglandins. Simple, right? Huh? Inflammation, what is coming to your mind immediately are the prostaglandins. What is coming after that? After that is coming the cardinal signs of, of inflammation. Pain, inflammation, uh, what else? Uh, pain, inflammation, clot, and mucus, okay? So mucus, we are going to see that later. All right, so... Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not going to add more because it's going to be overwhelming. So the mucus is related, for example, with the mucus of the stomach. We didn't talk about that yet, so that's why I'm going to skip it. But just remember, four of them, mucus, clot, inflammation, and pain. You okay with that? Okay. Yep. Excellent. So let's keep moving. All right, so how the pathogenic bacteria cause illness? All right, so I will tell you one thing. This is one important thing I want to tell you. So from all 100% of bacteria that we have in, in the world, only on less, one, less than one or less than 1% 1 of that bacteria can produce disease in our body. Not all bacteria are invading our body. Are you okay with that? Okay. So. The, the bacteria who are called pathogenic bacteria, pathogenic bacteria means bacteria who produce a disease. Okay, so those are called generally germs. 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 Germs is not whatever bacteria. Germs is considered a bacteria who cause a disease on the body. We okay with that? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so now. Uh, in the previous class, we was talking about how to identify the bacteria, right? According to the shape, the organization, and the, uh, and the uh, staining of gram positive and gram negative. So that is one. The ability. Uh, then we have the metabolism. Metabolism. We already talked that the bacteria can be classified in aerobic, aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. Anaerobic bacteria. Aerobic means they do aerobics because they need oxygen. Anaerobic, they do not need oxygen. Aerobic, for example, the bacteria for tuberculosis. Tuberculosis can affect all any part of the body, but the most favorite place for the uh, tuberculosis is to affect the lungs. Why? Because in the lungs we have a lot of oxygen, right? The aerobic bacteria, right? Anaerobic bacteria, so basically, are located in the uh, mostly in the uh, GI tract, in the GI tract. There is no that much oxygen. They don't need that much oxygen. That's mostly where they will leave the anaerobic bacteria. So the ability to sporulate, the sporulation, sporulation and the endospore, right? So somebody is is throwing to you, you are, you are, we are a bacteria, and somebody is throwing you stones in your body, uh, to you. So you're going to protect with the capsule. 
So the, the stones are not going to hurt you anymore. So for example, antibiotics are going to have the same effect as throwing a stone towards you. You are the bacteria. So what happened? The, that cover is called the endospore, endospore, endospore. And then when the danger is gone, you get rid of the endospore or the shield that you put it over you and they start to do your activity. You reproduce, reproduce, and that process of spore, uh, that process of endospore and then reproduce after that is called sporulation. For example, we have the Clostridium difficile, the C. diff, C. diff that we talked in the previous class. Okay? All right. So now, uh, all right, opportunistic bacteria, opportunistic bacteria are going to be those bacteria who are waiting, or organism waiting that your immune system is down. When is your immune system is down? So this is a recap from previous class. Number one, too young person, because the immune system is not completely developed. Your immune system is down. Second, early, too early. So the person is being catabolic. They don't produce enough proteins. And you know, proteins are enzymes. And where mostly are the, some of these enzymes are located in the white cells. So you don't protect your, your body as before. So that is actually, uh, your immune system go down, opportunistic bacteria are going to make actually a party with that, right? Another one, malnourishment, malnourishment. Malnourishment involves actually low levels of proteins and proteins are needed to produce enzymes that protect against bacteria. And for actually people with cancer, with not just cancer, the cancer treated with chemotherapy, radiotherapy. What is going to do that is to destroy the red bone marrow and the red bone marrow produce what? Red blood cells, white cells, are being destroyed, so your immune system is going down. You okay with that? All right, so that is the recap from previous class. All right, so let's talk about infection versus intoxication. Okay? All right, so uh, infection versus intoxication. So what is intoxication? Intoxication is, is different from infection. Different from infection. I told you in the previous class that the bacteria is like you and I. We we born, we die, we reproduce, we grow, we eat, we drink, we pee, we poo, and we make gas, right? So it's like a living or like a you and I. So we are doing all that stuff, right? And the bacteria is doing that as well. So I will tell you one example. Oh, okay, let's let's do. So the poo poo. Let's make it simple first. The poo poo of the bacteria. Is called is what we call a toxin, toxin, toxin. What is toxic? So you have somebody who is toxic around you, right? So it's destroying all your your peace of mind, right? So the same thing is happening with a with a uh, with a bacteria. This toxin, what is going to do is to disrupt and destroy the cells. Are going to destroy the cells. This is a chemical that are going to literally perforate are going to destroy the cell membrane of the cells and that produce actually destruction of the cell, toxic. Who is doing that is the poo-poo of the bacteria. Now we are not going to call poo-poo the bacteria, we are going to call the toxin, toxin. We okay with that? All right. Yep. Yeah, do you know, I'm going to give you one example. Do you know somebody who has in the past a strep throat? Strep yep. throat, right? A strep throat. So what is the problem with the strep throat? Besides the fever, the chills, the pain, the sore, sore throat, etc. So that is basically you need to treat it immediately. You know why? Because they can have three problems. Number one, produce cardiac problems. They can produce articular problems. And the most dangerous and more faster is kidney failure. Kidney failure. Kidney failure. So the kidney is failing. So, and that can kill you. So, a strep throat. All right, so let's keep going here. So, if you open your mouth, the strep throat colonies are going to be on the back of your throat. Yes or no? Yes. Right? Yes. All right, so that is where this is the strep throat, right? So, they say make a swap and they make a diagnosis, whatever, and there's a strep throat. Okay, antibiotic immediately. Okay, but let's suppose that the patient having a strep throat and he want to play a uh, champion or super superman or super women and they take some otc whatever 
but they don't cure the streptococcus. So what happened in the in the next uh, uh, few months, even years, they are going to become chronic and produce damage of the kidney. You enter into kidney failure, kidney failure. All right. So now listen to this, please. You expect that the streptococcus is going to be in the kidney. Let's do like a magic procedure. So you have already kidney problems because of the strep throat and the strep throat is in your throat, but then kidney problem, how the kidney is going to fail. For some magic procedure, you open the, the, the body and take the kidney out and open the kidney to see what is inside. You will not find not even one streptococcus, not even one. There is no streptococcus in the, in the kidney. There is none. So what is causing the kidney failure? The, what is causing the, uh, the, the kidney failure is this. You have the strep throat in your throat. And they are going to do poopoo, -poo, right? The toxin. Yeah, I'm not going to say poopoo -poo anymore. Toxin. Toxin is the waste product of the, of the bacteria. This toxin is going to be absorbed by the circulatory system. Not the bacteria, the toxin. And this toxin is going to go into the kidney. And that is what is going to produce the nephro, nephro kidney toxicity of the kidney and destruction of the kidney. Do you okay with that? The toxin. Do you okay with that? Is that clear? Yes. Yep. So that is the best example that we can get on that. All right. So let's keep moving. What toxin causes that, Dr. G? Sorry? Because what type of toxin, what toxin causes the renal failure? All right, so we have, uh, all right, so th there is toxins are proteins, okay? And these toxins are going to have proteins that have a shape. And basically the kidney is the one mostly what is more uh, susceptible to suffer that because the receptors are on the kidney are matching the receptors or the protein shape of the toxins. So I'm going to go into more detail. What is doing toxin? Toxin, when they get into the kidney, what it's doing is to produce vasoconstriction of the vessels. Vasoconstriction. This vasoconstriction of the vessels are going to decrease the blood flow to the kidney and less oxygen, the kidney starts to die. Nephron by nephron, nephron by nephron. And that is goodbye kidney. After 60% of the kidney are being damaged, you enter officially into kidney failure, kidney failure. The other classification that probably you are talking about and that's what I'm going to mention is this. So we have two types of toxins. One toxin is called, write down this, is the exotoxin, exotoxin, E-X-O toxin. With O-O, exotoxin, okay? You write it down? Okay, exotoxin. And the other one is the endotoxin, 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 E-N-D-O. Um, Dr. G, are you supposed to be sharing your screen with us? Yeah. Oh, yes. So why you don't tell me? Why um. everybody said it? Oh, my God. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, here we have the bacteria. This is the bacteria. And the bacteria is going to do the poo-poo, right? That is the waste product after they eat, right? After you eat, you produce poo-poo, yes, right? So the bacteria, when they satisfy and eat, they actually process everything and they're going to eliminate the waste product called toxin, this toxin. That is the streptococcus, for example, a streptococcus, a streptococcus, a streptococcus, beta hemolytic, whatever, all right? So toxin, this toxin are going to go to the kidney and they are going to destroy the kidney. How? Because the toxin produced cause actually vasoconstriction, means less oxygen and the death of the tissue of the kidney. Okay? All right. So that is one. Now, the classification of toxins, oh my God. Okay. The classification of toxins are going to be two the exotoxin and the endotoxin. What is the exotoxin? I'm going to draw it here. The exotoxin is the bacteria who is going to produce toxins, eliminate toxins. And that is the example of the streptococcus. 
the endotoxin, endotoxin are bacteria where the toxin is like a knife that is located into, uh, oh my God, what happened? Okay, all right, so let's do it again. So I don't know what happened. The screen was off. All right, so exotoxin, the strep, streptococcus, and the endotoxin, endotoxin, are going to write down one name that is very common, especially in diabetic patients, is the pseudomonas. Pseudomonas. Another exotoxin will be the E. coli. E. coli that we're talking for our E. coli is the best example because we talked about, about that in the previous class. The exotoxin, the bacteria, is going to eliminate eliminate a toxin. And uh, this endotoxin is going to be in the cell membrane of the bacteria here, like small knives on the bacteria. So this endotoxin are going to be in contact with the cell, normal cell, and destroy the cell. So the toxin is coming with the bacteria, have contact with the bacteria. So the bacteria is like you are a bacteria and you have like a knife here in your, in your, in your head. And then you touch something and you destroy whatever you touch, right? So that is the endotoxin, endotoxin. You okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Now, the exotoxin, and listen, this is the link from the previous class. Exotoxin mostly are located in the gram positive. Gram positive. Exotoxin. Exotoxin. Endotoxin will be the basically the gram negative. Endotoxin, the gram, the, the E. coli, they have some two exotoxins but there are mostly of them are going to be endotoxins. So it's basically the gram negative, E. coli, the best example, E. coli. The gram positive, we have the streptococcus, streptococcus, for example, staphylococcus. Um, yes. Okay. So, um, but the bacteria that are gram negative have both the exo and the endotoxin? That's correct. The... That's correct. But mostly of these bacteria have they have so so they have exotoxin, but the most dangerous is the endotoxin. Okay, so that's why remember who is more difficult to kill: the gram positive or the gram negative? Gram negative. Why? Because they have this double cell wall, correct? See, and in addition to that, they are being the 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 weapons that they have are exotoxins, but the majority of these weapons are going to be endotoxins. You okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So that is what you need to remember about toxins. We have exotoxins and endotoxins, and that is what is coming in the next slides. All right. So now, um, all right. So this is the part of the food. This is I'm going to make very, very, very easy. The food safety. Okay. So how many of you uh, who like to cook here? We like to cook. I, I, I'm a very good cook, by the way. I like to cook. I like to cook. Excellent. 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 Marcel, you see, Miss, oh, oh, you like to cook? You like to cook? What is your favorite? Okay. Not really. <laughs> Not really? Okay. All right. All right. So tell me, when we cook a food, all right, so the cook is prepared already. So uh, the rice, let's make it the rice. The rice. The rice. Uh, the rice need to once is first of all the bacteria is going to grow in environment where is nutrients and some temperature so we have ideal temperature of the bacteria the bacteria is going to grow under conditions that are appropriate temperature and nutrients correct now if you cook the food there is bacteria all around your your kitchen floating everywhere you don't see them of course right but if you leave the, the rice, for example, two days, three days, what happened? Mostly are going to be bacteria, right? So why the bacteria? How, how you can tell the bacteria? Let's make a, a homework, homework, okay? Homework. Homework, let's go to Safeway and buy the cheapest meat because the meat already is skyrocketing prices. 
Do you, you know that, right? And buy this meat and leave it in your backyard, in your garage, in your garage, in your garage. And come back after one week. What happened with that meat? Right? The meat is totally rotten, correct? So why is rotten? Because the bacteria is eating that meat. If you see here in a few days, the the because the meat is surrounded by a plastic, right? You will see like a balloon. There's a gas inside. Why? Because the bacteria is eating and make gas, like you and I. Got it? Right? Got it. Yeah. If you eat that, you're eating a lot of bacteria. So the bacteria is going to proliferate according to the temperature and the nutrients, right? And if you cook a food, you cook food, you need to be careful on that. Why? Because if you don't make the refrigeration, you're going to basically promote the proliferation of bacteria. And you can have a lot of signs and symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, etc., and all the stuff that we are going to mention in a few, in a few uh, moments. All right, so number one. Number two, careful with this. Are you ready? Temperature, high temperatures kill the bacteria. High temperatures kill the bacteria. Low temperatures do not kill the bacteria. What is going to do the low temperatures in the refrigerator is to slow down very much the division of the bacteria. So you, you have a stew, and the stew, you, you can keep it one, two, three days in the refrigerator, but what will happen if you take it one year? Right? So it's going to be a lot of bacteria. The appearance, the taste is going to be totally different. Okay? All right. So for this, food safety. And we, this is the food safety here. Here we have cooking hot kill bacteria. Frozen foods slow bacteria reproduction. Reproduction. All right, so for this, you need to remember we have the uh, temperature danger, danger zone. The temperature danger zone is when the bacteria is being between 40 and 140 Fahrenheit degrees, that is the temperature where the bacteria is going to grow. For example, 40 degrees. How much is your refrigerator? Refrigerator is about 42, 38, right? So 38 will be better in order to go out from this range because between 40, 45, 50, 100, 120, 130, 140, that is the area where the bacteria is growing. That is where the bacteria is growing. So that's why if we put in the refrigerator less than 40, the bacteria is going to stop or delay very slow the cell, the reproduction of the bacteria. So you, your food can last few, few, few days. You okay with that? So then, so what is the danger zone? The danger zone between 40, 240, simple, right? 40, 40, yes, 40, 140. 40, 140, 140, 40, 140, right? It's going to be the, um, the temperature. How much? Oh, 60 degrees. 60 degrees is uh, Celsius. I will tell you something. When you put your finger, how you can tell, <laughs> can you can tell the temperature without the ther ther thermometer? So when you put your finger in, in hot water, right, your 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 uh, your finger can stand only 140 Fahrenheit degrees. More than that, you're still feeling the burning. So you put your finger, your finger is oh, it's very hot. Take your finger out. That is approximately actually 140 Fahrenheit, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, or 60 degrees Celsius. You okay with that? Got it. So now, so you now you can tell the boiling is much more than that, 212, something like that, right? So what you're doing is to kill the bacteria. You all right? So I have yeah. I have a food that put a very nice food in the refrigerator, and now I, so you said based on this, I can boil it and the bacteria is gone. Yes, it's gone. But how many times you can do that? How many times you can boil the food? And that is a limit. All right, so the maximum time that you need to have the food after, so you cook something, 
Of course, you cannot put it after you finish to cook immediately in the refrigerator because it's going to, uh, temperature is going to break the, the window, the glass is there, right? So you need to wait until the temperature is going down and then put it in the refrigerator. So the time then after that you're going to take it out is going to be only allowed just one, one time heat it up. You can heat it up only one time, only one time. So why only one time? Because if you heat it up more than one time, that means that you're going to start losing all the, uh, the nutrients, content. The proteins are going to be degenerate, destroyed. The vitamins are gone. The uh, Actually, all the, all the uh, nutrients are going to basically be low in that food. Now, how much time you can take it out from your from the from the refrigerator maximum three hours maximum three hours maximum three hours total. so that means if you take the food out of the refrigerator for one hour out you have two hours left if you take from the refrigerator the food for two hours you put it back in the refrigerator so the next time you have maximum one hour otherwise you have a risk to have actually um, uh, infestation of bacteria. You okay with that? Yep. All right. And again, food safety rules, wash hands. One of the first things you're going to learn in fundamental is how to wash your hands. Okay? Wash your hands. All right? So they're going to teach you very, very much on that. So wash hands. Then maximum three hours, leftovers must be quickly cooled and refrigerated immediately. Makes sense. Food left over can be reheated only once. When reheating food, make sure that the, uh, to bring the internal temperature of the food at least 140 degrees. And you can tell just putting your finger, don't get burned, okay? All right, so memorize this because that is will be test on these few things, okay? Nice, right? Got it. Yeah. All right, so there are questions there. And now we are going to talk about super favorite, these bacteria. All these bacteria, listen to this, are coming for the exam. Okay, so we are going. And let me see how many bacteria we are going to talk. Very, but very, very brief. I'm, I'm not going to elaborate too much. E. coli, one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14, 14 bacteria. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> this is very nice, huh? All right, we're okay with that? All right, so let's start with the E. coli. E. coli, E. coli, uh, just I need to mention this. E. coli, the most common bacteria for UTI is whom? E. coli. The E. coli. 97% of, uh, of UTIs, uh, lower UTIs, are going to be caused by E. coli. Okay? E. coli. So I'm going to be E. coli where it's coming. Coming, the E. coli are in the stools. In the stools. In the stools. 20% of the weight of the of the of the what of the stool is going to be bacteria, right? And one of these bacteria are going to be the E. coli. The E. coli. This E. coli, this E. coli, actually, when you don't wash your hands, you are transmitting the uh, the bacteria to the objects, to the fork, to the tools, whatever you put in in the uh, in your mouth. They are going to be basically. Uh, if you don't wash your hands after you go to the bathroom, that is very, very, very bad, okay? So you're transmitting, you're putting risk the people around you, right, or, or anybody. So when you eat E. coli, there is different type of E. coli. I'm not going to go in that. But what I want you exactly to remember, that E. coli can cause severe diarrhea, severe diarrhea, right? So the spreading out, let's read here, is oral fecal route. Oral fecal route. What is oral fecal route? So you go to the bathroom, you clean yourself, you don't wash your hands, and then you put your fingers in your mouth or touch the fork or the tools and put it in your mouth. 
or you just grab an apple and the apple is going to be the E. coli, right? So E. coli, you need to be very careful with especially uh, vegetables who are short, short, uh, short stem. Like for example, uh, strawberries, okay, strawberries. What else? Can, uh, lettuce, right? Lettuce, tomatoes. Those are basically uh, uh, growing uh, at the level of the of the soil, and that is where mostly E. coli are. Okay, so you need to watch that very far. So very much, you need to watch that very carefully. All right. So E. coli for the exam causes diarrhea, severe diarrhea. Okay. Second. Yeah. Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus, as we already talked, as well as the Staphylococcus E. coli, e. coli is gram negative. Staphylococcus aureus, aureus, there is different type of Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus epidermidis, for example, or Saprophyticus. There is many, Staphylococcus is the last name, and they have many, in, uh, uh, many, uh, uh, I mean, components of the family, right? Staphylococcus is very kind of, very, uh, very, very bad. All right, so now, uh, all right, so tell me one thing. How many of you, you like potato salad? Potato salad. I do. Yeah, excellent. So potato salad, right? The potato salad is, is very common to see Staphylococcus aureus. It's very, 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 very common. So what happened here? Look at this. Potato salad, I will say, come into my head that let's go to uh, uh, to to a camping and let's go to some uh, some camping, right? So you go to camping and you prepare ahead of time the potato salad, right? The potato salad mostly is going to be in a cooler, and uh, but you don't want to eat potato salad that are uh, too cold, right? So they put it on the table. Obviously, you go to a park or to to, I don't know, some place where you put the potato salad covered by something, right? Until waiting, that is basically time to eat. So, but what happened? The temperature, again, that is going to promote the proliferation of Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus. This Staphylococcus aureus produce an exotoxin, gram-positive exotoxin. These exo exotoxins are going to be in the potato salad, because it's covered by a plastic, by, by something, and the temperature and the time that is resting is going to be enough time to the staphylococcus produce this toxin. Now, do you notice that some people eat the potato salad? Oh, I have food poisoning. You don't have food poisoning. Well, that is the lucky one. The lucky one, they took the portion of the potato salad with most concentration of the toxin of the staphylococcus aureus it was and the other doesn't, didn't. So actually they can show, one can show signs and the other not. And this produce, this what is going to produce nauseous, vomiting and diarrhea is what we call food poisoning. It's what we call food poisoning. And that is going to happen in the next six hours. That is characteristic of Staphylococcus aureus. So what is causing the disease? The Staphylococcus itself? No, what is doing is causing this is the toxin the exotoxin of the staphylococcus. So it's going to be the nauseous vomiting and diarrhea. Are you okay with that? Yep. Okay. Is that the same um, as what we refer to as staph infection? No, a staph infection, a staphylococcus infection, it can be in other parts. Staphylococcus itself, the staphylo staphylococcus, any bacteria is like the prey and the hunter, right? So Staphylococcus is a very brave, very hard hunter. So they destroy cells. You can have Staphylococcus uh, infections on the skin. You can have Staphylococcus infection in the urinary tract. It's the second most common bacteria on UTIs, Staphylococcus. And uh, you can have Staphylococcus uh, infections on the, on the muscles, on the bones. I saw patients infection with the bones, Staphylococcus. So they can be any place, by the way. And those are the staphylococcus itself, okay? That staphylococcus. We are talking here is the toxin of the staphylococcus. I don't know if I answered your question about that. You did, you did thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so now, uh, keywords here, methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus. It's called the MRSA, 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 MRSA. 
This is very important. Why is called, listen to this, meticillin. Meticillin is an antibiotic. What kind of antibiotic is that? Penicillin. Penicillin. Everything that ends in silin, 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 amoxicillin, ampicillin, meticillin, silin, silin, silin is penicillin. So this penicillin are not going to make effect in certain types of staphylococcus. So that's why it's called meticillin resistant staphylococcus aureus. So the staphylococcus aureus is resistant to, the, to, uh, to penicillins. So um, uh, meticillin was one of the first discovered in the late, uh, in the early 50s that was because at the beginning, uh, antibiotics was thinking that it's going to, oh, we discover antibiotics. We never going to have, nobody's going to die for, for infections. But later on, the bacteria start to produce resistance. So they know how to uh, destroy the antibiotics. So that's in simple words. The bacteria learn how to destroy the antibiotic. So you give antibiotic to this bacteria, the bacteria destroy the antibiotic, there is no effect. So that's why it's called resistance to the antibiotic. And the first one that was discovered was the MRSA, M, meticillin, R, resistant, S, staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, MRSA. What I want you to remember about this, where is where you find most commonly in the patients? You will find the MRSA in patients we have long time laying down in bed. So bed sores, bed, bed ulcers, or bed sores infections. So that is where you're going to find these most commonly infections, okay? So you need to be careful with this patient. The patient bed sores are going to be basically higher risk to to carry the MRSA. Are you okay with that? Yes, um, Dr. G, isn't MRSA um, highly contagious? Yes, it is. Okay, and uh, uh, well, uh, the the treatment is vancomycin. It's too early for you guys to know that vancomycin is the first line of antibiotic. Yes, very contagious. So be careful with you need to use gloves and protection, etc. Right. So it's basically gloves. Okay. Got it. Thank you. All right. So. We can talk more about MRSA if you want another another time or during the break or whatever. But if you if somebody want extra, just let me know. We have the Treponema pallidum. Treponema pallidum. Treponema pallidum. You need to remember the name very well. Treponema pallidum. That is syphilis. Can you see the shape of the bacteria? It's like a spiral, a spiral shape. Right. We talk about coccus, bacilli. We talk about. Uh, we have a, a spiral. We have like a a comma, like a small comma. So we have different, different shapes. The most common is what we just mentioned, coccus and bacillus. Just to let you know about Treponema pallidum, is caused syphilis. Syphilis, 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 syphilis. Syphilis is a very bad, uh, a very bad uh, infection. They can last for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So somebody was having syphilis, for example, in the 1700s, that was a sentence of death. They was isolated, was actually discriminated, whatever. Because at that time, we didn't have antibiotics. Antibiotic is coming from where? From 1912, from Fleming, French doctor. So that is where the era of antibiotic therapy starts. Before, we didn't have antibiotics. Everybody was dying from whatever infection was, was having, right? OK, so now. Um, this syphilis was actually sentence of death in the 1700s. In the 1800s, the sentence of death was tuberculosis. In the 20th century, it was HIV. So the sensation that people having for HIV was the same sensation that was having at that time. So just remember, treponema pallidum, syphilis. Are you okay with that? That is uh, commonly EC in patients with immunocompromised, like HIV, AIDS. All right, so here we have the uh, Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Neisseria gonorrhoeae, we mentioned in previous class, is a diplococcus, is a gram-negative diplococcus, diplococcus. It's caused by, a, by a, it's an STD, a sexual, sexual transmitted disease. So what is in the star, look at that, the stars. I put the stars, that is what I want you to remember. You okay with that? All right. So here, Niseria gonorrhoeae or blenorrhagia 
causes excessive secretion produced by external genitalia. Is what we call this. This is the urethra or penis. And here, every morning, was having a, a drop of pus. So that is what we call the good morning pus. The good morning pus. Drop of pus. All right? So that is actually a can produce infertility, etc., etc., etc. All right, so here we have the uh, uh, what will you I want you to remember because excessive segregation produced by external genital. What is this drop? This drop is pus. This drop is pus. What is pus? What is pus? Pus is dead bacteria, dead white cells, dead macrophages, dead normal cells. So it's a combination of water and electrolyte. All these kind of cocktail are going to create a pus. So that is mean that there is a lot of inflammation process that occur in the in the uh, genital area, okay, in the uh, reproductive organ. We okay with that. Yeah. I may fall. I may follow influenza. I may follow. Haemophilus influenza is is making you think about. Influenza virus, right? Influenza virus. But this influenza virus is a virus. This is Haemophilus influenza. It's a bacteria. It's a different situation. So at the beginning, we knew for a long period, for a long time ago, that there is a, a bacteria called Haemophilus influenza. This Haemophilus influenza could, could cause high fever, high fever, especially in kids less than four years old, respiratory problems. So what happened here is that when they have a flu virus, they were thinking that was this guy, Haemophilus influenza bacteria. But the, later on, they discovered that was not a bacteria, was a virus. And because of this similar, similar occurrence are actually called influenza, but virus. So this virus, influenza, Haemophilus influenza, bacteria is totally different story from flu virus, okay? All right, so what is doing this is cause meningitis. Meningitis, meningitis. What is meningitis? Meningitis is actually a membrane called the meninges. Meninges. These meninges, what are doing the meninges? This is the central nervous system, look at that. Central nervous system, this is the spinal cord all the way. So what is the meninges? The meninges are this uh, triple layer, triple, three layers of membrane that are surrounding the whole central nervous system. One plastic bag here, one membrane here, another membrane here, two, and another membrane here, the third one. So they are going to be covered by the meninges. Okay? They can produce meningitis. Talking about clinical is a lot to talk about that. So I'm not going to go on that. Just remember that produce inflammation at the level of the central nervous system, producing meningitis, meningitis. We okay with that? Okay. Yes. All right, so let's talk about salmonella. Salmonella enteric, salmonella typhi, typhi. This, uh, this salmonella, salmonella can cause ulcers in your intestines. Where you get that? There was an outbreak of outbreak is the name yes of of this uh, salmonella in Indiana. They died like fifty cases some time ago. I don't know how long ago. And actually, uh, all the recommendation is this. Do you hear this recommendation? When you cook chicken, you need to wash the chicken very well. And after you use the tools to prepare the chicken, you need to wash it very well apart. And the area where you put the chicken on the on the table, you need to clean it very much because there is high risk to have salmonella. Salmonella, okay, especially located in the chicken, okay. So now, uh, 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 this salmonella, what is going to cause is go to the intestines and produce ulcers, producing perforation of the intestine, perforation of the intestine. This perforation can produce all the fecal material go to the abdominal cavity. You get into sepsis, and then basically it's very, very high risk for to die because of septicemia. Marcel, are you going to too to fast? We okay with that? The speed is okay? Yes, it's okay. 
Okay. Um, can you just go back on um, the fecal matter goes into into the, the abdominal cavity. cavity into the cavity okay. and that is you know fecal material they have a lot of bacteria and that can produce sepsis because it's spread out to the vessels multi-systemic infection and that's goodbye okay so all right so we okay with that yeah we're good good here Okay. Bacillus cirrus. Bacillus cirrus is one of the bacteria that can produce sporulation. Okay. So I'm going to uh, actually tell you exactly. This bacillus cirrus, I, I want to be, you to be very careful if somebody is pregnant. I don't like, so, so a pregnant, from my point of view, or my suggestion is you to eat always fresh food never leftovers, never left over, because it's a, it's a risk for actually uh, have uh, problems with uh, electrolyte imbalance because they can produce nauseous and vomiting, all right? Nauseous and vomiting, and that can produce some electrolyte imbalance can affect your pregnancy. So one of the most common examples is the rice, the rice. If you have the rice, put it in the refrigerator, don't eat rice one or two days after when it's exposed in the environment because by sure you have bacillus cirrus, bacillus cirrus, okay? All right, we okay with that. And the characteristic of this is that produce nauseous and vomiting, but usually no diarrhea, no diarrhea. There is no diarrhea in bacillus cirrus, okay? Yes. All right, so the helicobacter pylori, helicobacter pylori, the helicobacter pylori is the H. pylori, H. pylori. The H. pylori, what he's doing is, is a bacteria, is a bacteria that is located in the stomach, in the stomach, in the stomach, in the stomach. The pathophysiology is a little bit uh, elaborate, but I'm trying to make it simple. At the end, what is causing the H. pylori or helicobacter pylori is to decrease the protection of the stomach. So, all right, all right, so I can, I don't have escape, I need to tell you. You have the stomach, correct? Then the stomach. Just a moment. It's, uh, the, it's Mr. Bar just a moment, please. All right, so, all right, so listen, you have your stomach, right? And the stomach have gastric acid, yes or no? This gastric acid is very acid. It's very, very, very acid. So how come the acidity do not destroy your stomach? Right? And why is that? Because between the gastric acid and the stomach, there is a mucus. It's a layer that protect your stomach against the acidity. Mucus, for example, when you, what is a mucus? Mucus, for example, you have a cold, you have this secretion of your nose that is very thick, that is mucus. Okay, Mr. Velasco, okay, Mr. Velasco. All right, so the H. pylori, okay? So it's like, uh, like it's, it, I want just to you to be clear on that. The stomach itself, on the top of the stomach itself, there's a mucus, a layer of mucus. And on the top of the mucus is the gastric acid. So this layer is protecting the stomach to be in contact with the gastric acid. That is normal. So what happened with the H. pylori? The H. pylori, what it's doing is to decrease the mucus of that protection of the stomach. And what happened? The gastric acid is going to touch down the tissue of the stomach. Okay? 
You get with that? So the H. pylori, how you get that? When you go to an area, some areas inside or outside the country where the sanitary conditions are not appropriate, they are going to have the H. pylori. So if you're going, and these mostly are asymptomatic sometimes, they produce gastritis, gastritis, and you don't know where is, why is that coming gastritis one and again and again and again. And that can lead into ulcers. H. pylori lead into ulcers. And listen, 95% of stomach cancers are associated with the presence of H. pylori. So what we need to do is to, the next time you go to your doctor, ask, request for an H. pylori test. It's a breathing test, okay? So H. pylori, at the end, what we need to remember is that basically cause peptic ulcers, peptic ulcers. What is a peptic ulcer? Peptic ulcer is any ulcer, any ulcer that happened in the stomach or and the duodenum. You have an ulcer in the duodenum, that is peptic ulcer. You have an ulcer in the stomach, that is peptic ulcer. You have you have ulcer in the duodenum and the stomach, those are peptic ulcers. Peptic ulcers. You okay with that? Yep. Um, yeah. All right, so let's have a break now. Okay, I think we have a lot of bacteria, right? So we are going to do a recap in a few moments. All right, so I will give you the lunch break. It's going to be until 12.45. Okay. Thank you. All right. See you then.
That's why I bring my. Okay, guys, so let's get this start. Well, when you are here now, when the class is taking place, I just, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I have to take a break. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we start, we already talked about the, some of the bacteria. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about the mycobacterium tuberculosum. This is the next one. Okay, Mycobacterium tuberculosum is the bacteria for tuberculosis, okay? These bacteria, uh, uh, mostly of the time are going to affect the lungs, but this is a bacteria that can attack or can affect any tissues in the body. You can have tuberculosis of the lungs, you can have tuberculosis of the kidneys, tuberculosis of the, uh, of the brain, tuberculosis of the bones, so tuberculosis of the skin, on the skin. So you can have tuberculosis any place, any tissue are going to be, be, be invaded. Yes. All right, so what is this is that uh, most commonly affected tissues are lungs and bones tissue. So that is the only thing I want to you to know because we will talk about a lot of mycobacterium uh, tuberculosum or tuberculinum, it's most commonly called tuberculosum, we have the murium, we have the avium, we have many others and the treatment that is coming later. At this moment, what I want just you to remember is that mostly affect the lungs and bone tissue. Lungs, why? Because they are going to have a lot of oxygen, right? For example, it's the most common. All right, so here we have the Clostridium difficile. All right, so look at this. We have Clostridium difficile, Clostridium perfringes, Clostridium tetani and the Clostridium botulinum. Okay, so we are going to talk about the Clostridium. All the Clostridiums, all the Clostridiums are going to be uh, having a sporulation. They are going to sporulate. And we already talked about Clostridium difficile when we talk about the gut flora. The gut flora. So the gut flora, here we can see that this can produce uh, diarrhea. They can cause constipation at the very beginning, but remember bloating, abdominal pain. So this constipation is at the beginning. You can add diarrhea here, diarrhea. At the beginning is constipation, but then later on it's going to lead into, into diarrhea. All right, so if you, I'm going to show you, this is a normal, a normal, a normal intestine. Okay, so that is a, a colon image. And you will see how happened, what happened with the Clostridium difficile are going to do sporulation. You see that? All these are colonies of, of Clostridium difficile. These Clostridium difficile colonies are going to affect the mucosa, the mucosa of the intestine producing increase of peristalsis. That can lead into severe diarrhea, okay? So the, how to identify diarrhea of Clostridium difficile uh, it's coming later. So at this moment, what I want just you to remember is that Clostridium difficile can produce a lot of abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, at the beginning, constipation. Okay? Okay. Clostridium perfringes. Clostridium perfringes is what they call the uh, bacteria who eat meat. So that is commonly known this, but Clostridium perfringes are going to produce what we call gang gangrene. If you see here, the, in this food, mostly happen in patients with diabetic, the, diabetic patients, and they are going to produce a necrosis. You know what is necrosis, right? Necrosis? Necrosis means the tissue, right? Necrosis. Is dead tissue. Dead tissue or dead tissue? 
that tissue. So that is going, this area, dark areas here, this is necrosis, all these dark areas. So mostly what happened is that they need to make an amputation if they don't control from the very beginning. And all these clostridium, <coughs> clostridium difficile, clostridium prefringes are going to have a very intense exotoxin, exotoxin. All the clostridiums are going to be exotoxin. All the clostridiums are going to sporulate. All the, all the clostridiums are going to have the endospore. Endospore. Okay? All right. Cause gas gangrene. Gas gangrene because they produce a small, a, a, like a smell, very intense smell. And uh, it's called gas. Gas gangrene. All right, so let's talk, talk about Clostridium tetany. Uh, tet, um, this Clostridium tetany is a, a, a sporulate uh, bacteria again, and what it's doing is tetanus, tetanus, and spastic paralysis, spastic. Spastic means contracture, contracture. So is it going to be a, a, a spasm that is going to be very much a very energetic, strong contraction of of the muscles of the muscles. So this picture is a classical a classical picture where you see here that there are going to be contraction of all the muscle. Can you see the face? Can you see the neck? Can you see all the arch of the body? That is basically a severe uh, or late stage of tetanus. And these are so strong contraction that can produce fracture of the vertebras. Some some cases produce fractures of the vertebras. So when is happening the clostridium tetany? All right. So let's go. Let's go and walk into the beach without shoes. Without shoes. So and then you hit a metal that is rusty. Okay. This is where they leave the clostridium tetany. The clostridium tetany. If that is going to progress, that actually is going to start doing contractions of the surrounding tissue, surrounding muscles. And what happened here is that uh, I have a patient, unfortunately, was, uh, was uh, uh, well, was a kid of eight, nine years old. And what happened is that uh, he was costume tetany and was advanced. There was basically not much to do. So what I had to do is to put it in a dark environment, a dark room, no noises. Because the noises, even the light, can produce a stimulation of the contraction of the muscles. And that actually, uh, they can die from, because all the muscles are contracting, including the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is the muscle who you actually used to breathe. So in those time of para of contraction that last few seconds, a uh, few seconds, actually you cannot even breathe. So the patient is in a lot of suffering. Okay, so that is the clostridium tetany. That is going to have a toxin. Okay, all right. This, the last one is the clostridium botulinum. What is bringing to your mind the word botulinum? Some word coming with, with the word botulinum. Botulism. Ah, uh, sorry? Botulism. Botulism, right. But what about, uh, Marcel, botox? Botox is coming from this guy. The botox, what he's doing is when you apply Botox in your skin, you're going to relax muscles and the, and the wrinkles of your wrinkles of your face disappear because produce what we call flaccid paralysis. Flaccid paralysis. Flaccid means no contraction, totally relaxed. Okay, that is flaccid paralysis. Clostridium botulinum. Clostridium botulinum. All right, so that is. Just remember, costrium tetany, spastic paralysis. Spastic paralysis. Don't get confused. And costrium botulinum, flaxy paralysis. How to remember? Botox. Relax your muscles. The other one is the tetany. Tetany is going to be the opposite, the contraction. Okay? Okay. 
So now, how you can detect? Uh, you, in nutrition, you will learn that you cannot give in kids less infants or one year, one year or less honey because there was cases in the United States of botulism. So flaxi paralysis is going to involve all the muscles, including the diaphragm. So the patient basically are going to die from respiratory arrest. Okay, and the same respiratory arrest are going to die in the clostridium tetany, the previous one. Now, how do you know are going to, where is going to be the Christian uh, botulinum? Just to something to take you home. Uh, you go to the to the market and you will see this uh, can can uh, food like tuna or whatever is in a can in a can. So I don't want you to uh, I don't want you to uh, buy cans who are having some uh, uh, they are being twist or crack or whatever. So they need to be in perfect conditions. Why? Because if you open the can, you open the can, the can is covered by some kind of gray, gray layer, right? Gray layer. That gray, gray uh, kind of uh, lining of the can is going to be to avoid the contact with the iron of the can itself, the tin. The can have iron. And what happened? The, uh, the, when it's broken, are going to come a little bit of oxygen there and they are going to produce the production of Clostridium botulinum. Clostridium botulinum. Now, the example I want to give you is this. When you go and buy a can, you need to do this. How do you know it's a risk for Clostridium botulinum? This is a can, this is a jar, and you need to press here on the, on the top. And should be steady. But if you see that it's like a click, 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 when you press on the bottom, that means there is air inside. And that is most likely risk to have botulism, botulinum. You okay with that? Okay. okay. All right. So that is what is coming. All right. So gas gangrene, remember, is per, uh, a clostridium perfringens, diabetes mellitus. is the most common. All right. So acne. Agni is, uh, okay, Agni, I was talking about the, the potato salad, but the Agni that people having in the skin here in the face, these small uh, white heads are going to be basically infection with Staphylococcus. Staphylococcus. Okay. All right, so here, uh, all right, so it's a lot to talk about. All right, so just a few names I want you to remember. Look at this. S, I'm going to talk about the Estaphylococcus. Estaphylococcus. S, Treptococcus. We have the E. coli. We have the pseudomona. Okay, these are gram negative. This is very common, very common bacteria. I'm going to write it down properly here. Pseudomona. Pseudomona. Okay, pseudomona. Gram negative. Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Enterococcus, the Clostridium. Clostridium difficile, Clostridium perfringes, Clostridium botulinum, Clostridium uh, tetany. So those are gram positive. How to remember that? Staphylococcus with T, big T, positive. Streptococcus positive, Clostridium positive. It's not a rule. It's not a rule for all the all the bacteria. But uh, here, this strep Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, and Clostridium are easy to remember just writing the T that is positive. The E. coli and pseudomona are going to be very common to, and that is very uh, happen in, as uh, happen, uh, they are gram negative, gram negative. Okay, we okay with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, so talking about viruses. 
we have different type of viruses. Adenovirus, rhinovirus, coronavirus, uh, picornavirus. We have many, many. So these viruses, as you know, they are not going to be alive. They are need to have a host and they have an incomplete DNA and they invade a host in order to take the piece of the DNA that is missing, okay? So the viruses are going to divide it in viruses who contain DNA and other viruses who, that contain RNA, RNA. RNA, for example, will be the coronavirus, coronavirus, the pox virus, like, for example, chicken pox. Do you hear about the monkey pox already? Yeah. It's a new, it's a new one, right? This uh, monkey pox, supposedly, to be, what is the alarm here in monkey pox? Monkey pox start in Africa and then start to spread out in Italy, and, uh, UK, uh, like one one week ago, I I knew that there is one case in the in the East Coast of the United States. So and that can be a pandemic as well. These monkeypox supposedly to be eradicated, so I mean banned from the from the from Earth in 90, 1980. And there is a lot of studies and alarmists why it's coming back and why it's spreading out so fast. So from Europe to to uh, from Africa, Europe to United States is already about two weeks in between, and uh, and the thing is that uh, what, we don't know what is spreading out so fast, even more faster faster than the coronavirus. Anyhow, so those are the monkey pox. So they are going to the monkey pox are going to be when you have uh, close contact close contact with the lesions because they are going to appear some uh, blisters, some blisters on the on your hands, in your soles of your feet, right, on your soles. So, and then spread out to the rest of the body. So close contact and basically, especially with, uh, it's not a STD, it's not a sexual transmitted disease, but is considered a close contact that can lead into monkeypox. Okay, RNA. The DNA we have, for example, hepatitis B, hepatitis B. We have herpes virus, herpes. Oh, by the way, in RNA, we have the HIV. That's the question for the exam. All right, so now tell me, what is the difference between HIV, immuno, uh, human immunodeficiency versus AIDS? The severity. HIV. Huh? Severity? Okay. All right. So I will, uh, that, that is, yeah, that is, that is true. I'm going is to, it, oh, go ahead. HIV causes AIDS? Yes. Mm -hmm. Both of you are still right. All right. So I, I excellent. I'm going to make it very clear. Now, um, if not, because I think you have it already clear, but I will tell you. HIV patient is a patient who has HIV virus, okay? AIDS is a patient who has, as well, HIV virus. Both of them, they have HIV virus. But what is the difference between HIV and AIDS? HIV, you know, the, the HIV virus, when you are infected with HIV, you don't have actually signs and symptoms because what is the HIV doing? It's going to destroy the immune system. This, this destruction of the lymphocytes, of the lymphocytes, we will talk about later which type of lymphocytes, are going to be destroyed progressively. So there is a moment that your immune system, your lymphocytes, who are the ones who kill the bacteria and viruses, are going to be too low, so low, so low, so low, that is going to lead into infections. And HIV infect patients are going to be called now AIDS when they have when they show signs and symptoms. You okay with that? Yep. In the actuality, in, uh, now nowadays we have about fifty five thousand cases, all United States. In San Francisco, 
uh, is known that we have about 150, 150 new cases. San Francisco County, that is the city basically, are going to have 150 cases per year. And that multiplied by four. So that are the number of patients that doesn't know that are infected by HIV. When you have HIV virus, the HIV is um, the HIV is going to uh, take time to show to get into AIDS. How much is the time between seven to ten years? Seven to ten years. Seven to ten years is where the war between the immune system and the virus, the the immune system of your body start to lose the war. So up seven ten years, you start to show signs and symptoms of AIDS. So AIDS, you have HIV, yes. And HIV, you have HIV virus as well. Okay, we okay with that? Is that seven to 10 years with medical intervention or without? Without. Okay. Without. Without medical, medical treatment. Yes, HIV and AIDS. All right, so when somebody has contact with HIV, you know, it's uh, basically STD, the most common transmission is between still now, a day male to male. Male to male is the most common transmission of HIV. You have HIV today and you have a contact and you are totally asymptomatic. There is no signs and symptoms. The most you can have is a rush. If you have like a, like a cold, cold uh, signs and symptoms and the rush are going to appear and disappear in two, three days. And that's then they keep silence. And then they're going to uh, pass the then the patient starts to have recurrent infections. They go, go to the doctor and the doctor notice that you have uh, low levels of lymphocytes and they are going to do the ELISA exam. The ELISA exam produces a positive exam. They are going to confirm with the Western lot. And that is the process, okay? So pharmacology and medicines, we will talk about that unless you have some questions about this. All right. So uh, the DNA and the, and the RNA. The one thing I want you to remember for the exam is that the HIV is an RNA RNA virus. So the RNA virus, how I'm going to uh, give you kind of a, a general, uh, general most common appearance of the virus. The virus is going to be the typical virus there is different shape of virus, rounded, but the one I'm going to show you is like, like, like this. This is like that. This is a capsid, 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 cap, uh, capsid. This capsid is a protection of the, this is a virus, capsid. My pen is just capsid. This capsid is basically cellulose. Here inside you have the you have a DNA or, or you have RNA. So the viruses are classified as they, they contain DNA or RNA. Then we have here some like a tail, we call the tail like this. Like this. It's like a landing, like a like that. So what is this is like a, the tails is called where they are going to sitting or standing up on the on the cell membrane on the on the cell this is the cell they are going to stand up on the on the cell and then they are going to be like an injection they are going to inoculate here it's like a needle here and they are going to basically make an injection to the cell and the dna or rna of the virus is getting to the cytoplasmatic member cytoplasm of the cell okay so what is doing the dna the, remember the dna the dna is going to this uh, this is going to trick the trick the the cell so what is doing at the end is that this D, dna viral viral dna are going to copy the piece of the dna that is missing and then that is the moment that they can after that reproduce so this DNA that is coming here from the virus here are going to be an incomplete DNA. So they get into the cell and this DNA is going to copy from the DNA of the cell the, the, the portion that is missing in that DNA. So now 
they have a complete DNA and they reproduce. Now, those are like herpes, herpes zoster, herpes virus, shingles, etc., hepatitis B. So those are the type of viruses. The RNA, RNA virus, RNA virus, what is doing is a little bit different. RNA, I remember, is HIV. What is HIV? RNA. Coronavirus is RNA. Monkey, monkey virus is RNA. RNA, 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 RNA. Okay, open eyes, open ears with that. So what is doing this is that they are going to produce the uh, uh, RNA are going to need to be converted into DNA. And, and uh, that is that conversion is going to, if you remember, that the, the, the copy of the DNA is called the transcription, correct? Remember that? Yes. Okay, so and the RNA, what is doing is to make inverse because in the in the first type of virus, the DNA, are going to just copy directly from the DNA of the host. But in the case that the virus is RNA, they need to convert first of all the RNA and that to the to a DNA, and that DNA is going to copy the missing portion of the of the uh, of the uh, of the DNA of the virus from the host. That is going to be a reverse transcript. Uh, uh, trans, uh, transcript, reverse transcript, reverse transcript. So RNA, R, 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 N, A, re, re, reverse transcript. DNA virus transcription. Okay? DNA produce a direct copy of the DNA. And the RNA, they need to basically change into DNA first in order to copy the, uh, the DNA of the host. The RNA is going to have the reverse transcription reverse transcription all right reverse transcription and what is doing this hiv whatever we are talking about the rna is going to use an enzyme it's called the reverse transcriptase enzyme ace a s e reverse reverse transcriptase so this reverse transcriptase is the base of the treatment for to fight against hiv so if you block this enzyme that is going to make the conversion of RNA to DNA, the virus cannot replicate because they are being cutted in the process. So the RNA are need to be transformed in DNA. And this is called the reverse transcriptase enzyme, done by the reverse transcriptase enzyme. And what is the process called? The reverse transcription. This reverse transcription is done by an enzyme called the reverse transcriptase. And that is the target for treatments for HIV and for other viruses. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, so what time is it, please? 1.15. 1.15? All right, so I'm going to mention about the prions, that is the last, uh, and we can do some uh, some questions after that. All right, so the prion. Prion, do you, do you hear about the mad cow uh, disease? Yes. Yeah. Poor cows, right? So the poor cow, the, poor, the, the, the mad cow disease is, is a prion that have the ability to reproduce in the, especially in the brain tissue. They're going to basically produce degeneration, degeneration of the brain tissue, making like openings, like holes. This prion is uh, a protein, one thing. This protein cannot be destroyed by heat. It's not going to be able to destroy by heat. It's not that common, but where you can eat this prion from animals who are sick. So, for example, the mad cow disease, where is the prion located in their brain, in the central nervous system? And the way, the way to transmit that is to eat, to eat that, uh, that brain. Yeah, so you know there is food with brain, right? So 
I tried brain once in my once in my life. I didn't like it, but anyhow, it was an experience. That's fine. But uh, uh, cow, not all cows, of course, have mad disease, right? Cow mad disease. So, for example, you uh, I heard about. I never eat, but I never saw neither uh, taco taco brain, right? Brain taco or taco. Taco cabeza. Sorry, sorry. Do you do you do you see that? Yeah, taco cabeza. Taco, taco cabeza. cabeza. Is that called? Is that is the name? Oh. Uh -huh. Okay, so I never try it. I never try. But uh, definitely, is, that is even if they fry it, if they heat it up, they cook it. If the if the cow have the problem of mad cow disease, that is going to be transmitted to humans. Now, this cow, this uh, this problem can uh, it's not going to be immediately it's going to affect you in 10 20 years so it's an, a small progression of the of the disease okay all right okay so let's talk about we have probably time for um, metrology all right, so let's talk about the skeleton system. This skeleton system is going to be basically an introduction, okay? So, but before that, any question about virus? Anything that you want to know about virus? I give you basically the, the a very nice uh, Christmas tree, but if there is any question, whatever you want, just let me know. Any question? Enough for virus, right? Or any Okay, all right, excellent. All right, so let's talk about, uh, Marcel, you want to say something? No? Okay, okay, okay I will see. All right, Miss O, -O any question? Okay. All right, so let's get started with the bones. How many bones we have? We have 206 bones. 206 bones. Newborns, they have more bones than we do because the bones are not fused completely. When in adult life, they are going to totally fuse, so they have less number of bones. So anyhow, we have 206 bones, okay? And guess what? Bones, bones are part of connective tissue, as you already know, right? The, the hard connective tissue, right? And this connective tissue the bones are going to be one right down this of the most dynamic systems. They're always acting. They're always changing. Is the one is the most the one of the most dynamic systems in the body. You want proof of that? I will give you a proof of that. All right. So let's do it. So for example, when you have a, a skin, so a skin lesion. How long is it going to take the, the, the skin to heal? Depends how severe it is, right? But approximately one week is, is already done, correct? Now, so that is telling you how fast the tissue of the skin is actually repairing the tissue. Now, let's think about a broken bone. A broken bone. The broken bone, you know what? You need, if you have a broken bone like this, a bone like this, and then you have a broken bone, the bone basically is going to overlap like this, right? Now, if you don't reduce, so that means put the play in place, the bone, in the next 24 hours, this bone is already fused. See how fast is that in comparison to the skin? It's already fused. And this fusion what 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 happened is what we need to do is to just make a, a surgical fracture to fracture again and put it back but you have 24 hours you have a fracture of bone fracture you need to check in the next 24 hours before 24 hours because otherwise it's going to be much complicated okay, imagine imagine your femur broken and you have overlap like this you will be limping all your life because the size the 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 length of the lower extremity from the other is different, right? For example, okay? All right, so that is the introduction about the bones. And, uh, all right, system of all bones and joints in the body. Functions, support movement of the body. 
Yes, it's going to help for locomotion. Locomotion, locomotion. Imagine if you don't have bones, you will be like, we will be like amoebas, crawling on the ground, on those, on the, on the, with big eyes and ears. But we, are, we were crawling because we don't have bones, so we just crawl. So bones is going to help us for locomotion, for locomotion. Next, mineral storage. Mineral storage is the, especially the calcium. So why why all bones are, are white? Why bones are white? Calcium. Oh, calcium. Calcium, right? Same as the milk, right? The milk, what is white? Because it has a lot of calcium, right? All right, so that is mineral. And calcium is needed for what? Calcium is needed for what? Calcium is needed, number one, for bones. And remember this, what I was mentioned? Remember this or not? Remember this or not? We talk about this or not? Can we go over it again, Dr. G? Yes, yeah, sure. All right, so this is inside the cell. All this is inside the cell. This is outside the cell, outside the cell. Here we are going to have this graphic, what does it mean? So this graphic means that in the cell, this is the cell membrane, let's suppose the main cell membrane. This cell membrane are going to enter sodium. Sodium, and then it's going to enter calcium. So when is that happen? That happened for many reasons. In order to make the smooth muscle to contract, a smooth muscle contraction, for example, the walls of the arteries and veins, the gallbladder, the peristalsis in the GI tract, a smooth muscle, are going to need to enter sodium and then calcium to do the contraction. Then after that, this is the this area is the contraction. This line you see here, everything that is on the left is the contraction. What happened during the contraction. And the other one, everything that happened on the right side of this center line is going to be the relaxation. And that is the exit of potassium, the exit of chloride, and the exit of magnesium. So those are actually how the muscles are going to contract. So this, this uh, sodium enter and then calcium to complete the contraction. And then for calcium is what I'm focused now. So that is happening in a smooth muscle, in the skeletal muscle. What is the skeletal muscle? Is the voluntary muscle or the striated muscle. And they are going to uh, the same situation for the cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle. You need calcium for that. Cardiac muscle. And you have for the electrical impulse in the nerves. The nerves are going to produce electrical impulse when when sodium gets into the into the neuron and then calcium. That is where it's going to trigger out the electrical impulse of the nervous system. So calcium is not just needed for bones. Calcium is needed for other many other functions, right? One of the uh, the, mo the most uh, I mean important are going to be contraction with all muscles and function of the nervous system, the electrical impulse. Contraction, relaxation of muscles and electrical impulse of the nervous system. That is how or why we need calcium. You okay with that? Yep. Yes. So when you have these calcium levels, this calcium should be in normal range in the blood. What is the normal range of calcium? It's going to be 8.5 to 10 milligrams per deciliter. Okay? So when you have too low, too low, less than 8.5. If you have low, low than 8.5, the smooth, the smooth stride cardiac muscle nervous system are not going to have efficient, efficiently complete his functions because they have low calcium. So what is happening? So they are going to take calcium from the bones in order to reach, if they have, for example, 7.5 milligrams per deciliter, they remove calcium because calcium is a, in the bones is a mineral storage as well, 
that besides they form the bone, right? Is they are going to take calcium from the bones and they reach 8.5 to 10. So now all these functions are going to work okay. And the same thing, when you have too much calcium, 11 or 12 or 13 milligrams per deciliter, that excess of calcium are going to be removed from the blood and take it into the bone. Okay? There is many more things to talk about that. Calcitonin, PTH, we are talking of many others. So just, uh, this is the introduction of it. Okay, so, but for me, it's important you to remember this chart. Sodium, calcium, contraction, then it's going to exit out from the cell, potassium, chloride, and magnesium. Potassium, chloride, and magnesium are going to be out from the cell. And that is the moment where you have the relaxation of the of the of the muscle. And that is the moment in the nervous system that between electrical impulse and electrical impulse is a pause. Is actually a time that is not giving, it's not like giving electricity uh, all the time, continuously. No, it's going to be listen to the word, electrical impulses, pulse are going to be by pulses. The time between pulse to pulse is actually this area that is called the repolarization. Just to remind you, repolarization. The first talking about nervous system is called repolarization. Talking about muscles is the relaxation, re, re, repolarization, relaxation. And the first part that we have the contraction of the muscle that is called the depolarization, depolarization. That is the action potential of the cell. That is going to be so useful when you are going to learn about the activity of the muscles, myasthenia gravis, uh, uh, we are going multiple sclerosis, you're going to learn about arrhythmias, you're going to talk about hypertension. All these, all these, what I just mentioned, are going to be used to understand the activity of some drugs, for example, or the signs and symptoms of some diseases. You okay with that? So that is the basis. Is that clear or no, please? It's yeah. clear. Yes, clear. Okay. All right. So, in addition, we have we have a function that is coming for the exam. By sure. What else I can ask you, right? What else I can ask you? Yeah. So, so that is actually uh, important things, right? So you need to think about what is important to know, right? So prioritize things. All right. So now, here we have the blood formation. The blood formation, blood formation is going to happen. I'm going to draw a Flintstone bone here, a Flintstone bone. A Flintstone bone, this is a Flintstone bone. Okay, it's a long bone, could be radius, ulna, fibula, tibia, okay, etc. Uh, and here in this area, the distal portion of the bones here, in the distal portion of these long bones are going to be one structure that is very important. Is the red bone marrow. Is the red bone marrow. Do you like to eat the head of the chicken legs? Do you, do you like to chew that or no? Somebody? No. No? no. Well, chew it one time. Yes, I like. Very good, miso, miso. Okay, so when you eat that, you are eating red bone marrow of the chicken. Okay, make make that uh, exercise, mental exercise. You're chewing the the head of the drum the drum uh, sticks of the of the chicken. So what you're eating, what you're tasting, is the red bone marrow of the bone. And we have that. We have red bone marrow. These red bone marrow are going to be the place where it's going to be produced the red blood cells are going to produce the white cells and they are going to produce the platelets. I don't want to go into hematopoiesis, erythropoiesis, because little by little. So at this moment, what I want you to know is that red bone marrow produce these three lines of structures, red blood cells, white cells, and platelets. You okay with that? And that is a function of the bone. Protection of the internal organs. Protections of the internal organs will be the cranium, the thorax, the pelvis, right? So 
uh, imagine if we don't have cranium, right? Imagine if we don't have thorax. The brain, the heart, the lungs that are vital organs are not going to be protected, right? And they can have injury very easy. Okay, so how many functions we have of the bone? We have four, right? Locomotion. And let's try to make something here. Locomotion. Storage. Uh, blood formation. And protection. I don't know. You, you can make a mnemonic if you want, but if you can remember it just by heart, like this, that is perfect. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the. Let's talk about the the what, the main bones of the of, of the body. All right. So we have the cranium. This is the cranium. This is the cranium. Okay. All this is the cranium. Don't get confused, because the the all this is going to be called a skull. A skull. This area, anterior, and this area, all this area, from behind and anterior in the size too, are going to be called cranium. These bones that this part of the skull are going to be called are going to be called facial bones. Facial bones. So the skull are going to be divided in cranium and facial bones. Can you with that? The facial bones are everything that bones are on the face, right? And the rest is going to be cranium. Cranium plus facial bones is going to be called a skull. You okay with that? Here. Yeah. Okay. So we have the jaw or mandible. Mandible. Okay, mandible is going to be one mandible. How many mandibles do you have? One, right? Then we have the clavicle. Clavicle is called the collarbone. Do you hear about the collarbone? Yes. All right. Well, please, don't even try to talk to a doctor or to a nurse or, or colleagues. Oh, the collarbone. That is very kind of, I would say, colloquial, colloquial conversation. You can say collarbone to the patient that doesn't know what is clavicle, most likely, right? So, so you need to know you are actually in the position that you need to talk accordingly. You're not going to tell the doctor, doctor, the collarbone, or the nurse, or the collarbone. What the collarbone is? What are you? Where are you coming? Right. So, so be careful with that, right? So you need to choose the words according to the person in front of you. All right. So we have the sternum. The sternum is called the uh, the other colloquial is the, uh, how you call it? Chest bone, right? Chest bone. Sorry? Isn't it breast bone? Breast bone, sorry, yes. It's the breast bone. Breast bone. So you need to know what is the breast bone. Doctor, the breast bone. Nurse, the breast bone. No, what is that? Sternum, right? So patient, you can tell breast bone. So don't, don't say breast bone like for, for everything, okay? Depends the the uh what do you what is the situation then we have here behind here we have the scapula what is the scapula what is the the colloquial name name is the uh shoulder blade shoulder blade yes shoulder blade don't say shoulder blade to the okay we already know but shoulder blade is correctly to talk to the to the patient the patient doesn't know what is the scapula Right, scapula. All right, so we have, we already talked about the scapula. We have the humerus, the humerus, the humerus versus the femur. This is the humerus and the femur. All right, so those are uh, actually, what is equivalent to the femur in the leg is the, uh, the humor in that is going to be the femur. Okay, so femur and uh, humerus. This is the humerus, and this is the femur. All this is the femur. Femur, femur, femur. Okay, perfect. So now we have here the patella. Patella. Patella is called the kneecap, correct? Okay. So that is the colloquial way to say kneecap. So 
the kneecap w uh, is, is needed for something? Yes. The kneecap is going to stabilize, to make balance between the movement in the in the uh, lower extremity. Okay. So if you don't have kneecap, then you're going to start basically limping, like limping, okay? Losing your balance. So that is going to patilla or the kneecap is going to stabilize the locomotion or the lower extremities. Okay, so now I want you to check it out something here. Oh, before that, we have here the carpal bones, that is the wrist. Carpal bones, carpal bones are the wrist. We have eight bones on there. And the equivalent, these on the lower extremities are going to be the tarsal bones. These are the tarsal bones, tarsal bones. Tarsal versus carpal. Carpal are going to be the wrist, the wrist, and the tarsal bone is actually on the on the feet, on the feet. Okay. Okay. All right. So now let's go to something important here. Is this one the anatomical position? Anatomical position. The anatomical position that we talked in the past, I want just to, let's practice about that. So how many bones we have here in the, all right, first of all, how how you call this, all this? The arm. Extremities. Yeah. So the correct way is the upper extremity. Colloquially, we call arm all this, but arm, Technically, is this portion, only this portion. The proximal portion to your body is called the arm. And this portion, distal, that is going to be the forearm. Okay? Is that clear? Now, we have the lower extremities. In the lower extremities, colloquially, we call leg the whole lower extremity. But what is the leg? Leg is where you have the calf, the, below the knee. That is the leg. The upper portion is where is the femur is going to be the thigh, the thigh, thigh and leg. Is that clear? Colloquially, they, everybody call leg the all lower extremity. But the leg is the distal portion of the lower extremity. The thigh is going to be the proximal portion of the upper extremity. So we have what is equivalent of the arm with the, in the lower extremity will be the thigh. What is equivalent of the forearm on the lower extremity is the leg. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now Which bones we have here in the forearm? In the forearm, we have the radius and the ulna, correct? All right, so, all right, so please be careful with this because it's important. We have the radius and the ulna. And in the lower extremities, we have the tibia and the fibula. The tibia and the fibula. The tibia and the fibula. The question is, the, the radio and the ulna, which one is medial, which one is lateral? Lateral is the ulna. Uh, okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> Very good, yeah. All right, so now, I know you answered. I know that answer. So look at this, the first thing you're going to do is to stand, well, you're going to stand up and you're going to have your anatomical position. This is the anatomical position, okay? This anatomical position, you will see the palms in front. You okay with that? And here, we touch here, you have a bone. And touch below, you have a bone, correct? Yes or no, right? Yes. So the upper portion, the upper bone here in the anatomical position is the radius. Here on the top is the radius, and below that is the is the ulna. 
the ulnar bone. How do you remember ulna and radial? So first of all, you need to have your anatomical position. So you can remember ulnar. Ulnar is you, under. What is under? Here is under. Under, you, under, ulnar. On the top is the radial by, by, by ruling out, correct? Correct. Okay, is that easy? Miss O, oh, oh, we okay with that? Yes. Okay, Miss O. Oh. Now, second, on the lower extremities, we have the tibia and the fibula. Tibia and fibula. Which one is medial, which one is lateral? The tibia is medial or lateral? Medial. The tibia is medial, but you said, Miss, uh, uh, Miss Marcel, tibia, you need to say, Tibia is, is medial, right? So how we are going to remember that? So, all right, so I will tell you now. All right, so first of all, you need to know the two names. Troublemakers, of course. All right, who is this? Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> okay, all right, so we have the tibia and the fibula. Okay, tibia and fibula. Tell me, we, Try to imagine the bones, the tibia and the fibula. Who looks more stronger? The tibia. The tibia, right? The tibia is actually more thicker than the fibula. You okay with that? Everybody agree with that? Okay, how to remember. You have your toes. Which toe is the strongest? Big toe. And that is the, what number of toe is that? Number one. Number one, exactly. So when you have fingers here, anatomical position, go one, two, three, four, and five. On the toes, you count it from the big toe. One, two, three, four, and five. How to remember? The strongest is the number one, the thumb and the big toe. We got it? Got it. Okay. Now, the big toe is medial or lateral? Media. Media. So the big toe with a big bone of the leg. Got it? Got it. Now, another way to remember this, I give you another option, just to ruling out. Listen to the music. Fibula, 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 lateral. You got it? Fibula, fibula, you say fibulateral. Okay? All right, so you will never miss that. Okay. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so we have the, me the melius. The melius, you see, if you touch your foot on the side, side by side, you see like it's do, uh, two prominence, round prominence on the side by side of your foot. Do you notice that? Right? So this prominence, this prominence belongs to the bones. The more lateral, the, the prominence of the lat out, uh, outer from your foot, that it belongs to the fibula. And the other malleus that is on more inner or medial, that is belong to the tibia. All right? All right. So, we got that, so we already know all the main bones. There is many more. Anatomical position. Patella, carpal, radius, phalanges, mandible, tibia, femur, scapula, sternum, humerus. Phalanges. Phalanges are going to be the distal portions of your hands, right? Phalanges. Proximal, medial, and distal. The big, the big uh, uh, finger, uh, uh, the thumb is going to be Proximal and distal, there is no medial. And the same happened with the toes. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the vertebras of the column. How many vertebras we have on the on the column? We have 33, 33, 33, 33, 33. Okay, so write down this, please. Seven cervical. 
Oh, there, probably I have it right. Oh, there you are. Seven cervical. Cervical is basically the neck. At the level of the thorax, we have 12 thoracic vertebrae. Vertebra. 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. Lumbar, we have five, sacral five, and coccygeal four. Make the summation is 33. So seven, 12, five, five, four. Seven, 12, five, five, four. Seven, 12, five, five, four. Okay. Uh, all right. So for this, we are going to see something. All right. So do you want to know where is C? So we call cervical vertebra 1, C1, cervical vertebral 2, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. You okay with that? Okay. Now, I want you to do this with me. You're going to go like this, and then you put your finger here, two fingers, and then you're going to slide down. You need to bend your, ne your neck and go all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down. And then you feel a stop. That is a big bone. Do you notice that? Yeah. Right? That is C7. That big bone that you touch on the posterior of your neck, that is C7. And that is the end of the neck. Okay? Including the whole, the whole bulging. Not the beginning. The whole bulging is going to be the neck. Okay? That is the end of the neck, okay? Above the, above the body, sorry, above. No, no, the whole thing, above. As soon as you touch, that line is actually the end of the, the end of the neck, okay? How many thoracic vertebras we have? We have 12. You like, you like chilies? You, you eat chilies? Oh, you, yeah. eat, you like chilies? So you eat ribs, right? You eat ribs, right? Okay, so how many ribs we have? We have 12 pairs, 12 pairs, 12 pairs. Why I'm saying that is for a reason. We have 12 pairs, 12 pairs. So tell me, we have 12 pairs of ribs. How many thoracic vertebras we have? 12. 12. 12. Is it coincidence? No. Each thoracic vertebra are attached to a pair of ribs. So we have 12 pairs of ribs and we have 12 thoracic vertebrae. You okay with that? Yep. Okay. All right. So you don't have ribs on your neck. You don't have neck. Okay. So you don't have the ribs are started on the thorax. Okay. We got it? Yep. Yeah. All right. So let's keep moving. Okay. All right, so we have the ribs. Let me see. We have ribs and we have 12 pairs. The ribs are, I want to imagine all the ribs, all the 12 pairs of ribs are attached for every to every single thoracic vertebra. So we have 12 thoracic vertebra and side by side, side by side, are going to be attached a pair of ribs. That is posteriorly. But what happened anteriorly? What happened anteriorly, they are going to be in relation with the sternum, with the sternum here. And that relation with the sternum is what is giving us the names of the different type of ribs that we are going to mention now. We have the first two are very simple, true and false ribs. True and false, true and false, right? Thoracic, I mean, uh, uh, the ribs are going to be true and false. What are the true ribs? The true ribs are the first seven ribs, seven pairs, seven, seven, seven. And what is making, why is called true? Because these ribs, the first seven ribs, are going to be attached anteriorly directly to the sternum. Directly to the sternum. So, vertebra one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Directly to the sternum. Those are called the true ribs. 
the false ribs are the 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 next ribs means eight nine and ten eight nine and ten eight nine ten these eight nine ten are attached posteriorly to the vertebra but anteriorly they are going to get attached to the sternum not directly to the sternum but through in between through a cartilage so they are going to end are going to continue with the cartilage and that cartilage are going to get attached to the sternum those are called the false ribs okay yes and the last one are the floating ribs please the, those ribs are not floating they are not floating they call floating for a reason first of all the these last two pairs the 12 and 11 or 11 12 whatever you want 11 12 posteriorly are always attached to the thoracic vertebra 11 and thoracic vertebra 12 right they're attached posterior but anteriorly they are not attached to anything so they are not going to reach the sternum at any means right so they are not going to reach the sternum so that's why are called the floating ribs okay they have different considerations about this especially when you have car accidents in front of the floating ribs we have the kidney and we have the liver when you smash you have a car accident the ribs the floating ribs can do this on this on the liver or in the spleen okay the most common is the spleen the second most common is the kidney and the third most common is the liver so we will talk about another, another time but it's important you to know that we have the true seven the false three and the floating two so please don't get confused with the with the numbers so tell me number 10 is floating or very quick is floating or false number 10 false 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 uh, very good because the 11 and 12 how to remember that 11 and 12 the last two are floating Right. So 10, 9, and 8 are going to be the, the, the false. And 1 to 7 are going to be the true. Okay? Don't get confused in the exam. Don't read so fast. Read carefully. Okay? All right. Take your time. You have plenty of time. At least giving 20 to 30 seconds to read the question before reading the answers. Read the question first. Don't read the answers first. Read the question first. And when you have, you are satisfied to know what they're asking, you go then on the options. Okay? All right. Go ahead. Yes. All right. So the bone ossification. All right. So I'm going to make a summary here. We have five minutes. The bone ossification. All right. So. I think we have plenty. Bone ossification. What is bone ossification? Is the process process to create or form a bone. Ossification. Ossification. Process to create the bone. So what does it mean? They are going to produce the deposit of calcium. I will say, show you in, in, in uh, actually in a few moments. This process is called as well the mineralization. Mineralization is another way to call the ossification. Mineralization. Now, listen to this. All bones at the beginning, all bones at the beginning are cartilage. Are cartilage. Then cartilages are going to get deposit of calcium, calcium, and these cartilages are going to turn into a bone. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. The cells of the bone, and with that we finish. The cells of the bone. The cells of the bone, number one, we are going to talk about the osteoblast. Osteoblast. Question for example. Number two, the osteo, osteoclast. And I'm going to squeeze here. 
the osteocytes. I will tell you why I'm doing this. The osteocyte. Okay. Osteo means bone, as you know. Bone. Blast means new or young. Or young. Okay? So the osteoblasts, what they are doing is this. The osteoblasts are going to take, I will say, take calcium, take calcium and put it into the bone. Okay, so that is basically what he's doing. Every time you're taking calcium, doing exercises, uh, tell me, a person who is doing exercises every day and a person who is never do exercises, who has stronger bones? Person exercising. Per why, why is that? Why is that? Because the bones are attached to muscles. The muscles, when you are walking or exercising, make an attention against the bones, like pulling the bones, right? That is the support of the muscle. That process stimulates the more formation of or more deposit of calcium into the bones. You okay with that? Yes. But let me go out of the gym. Okay. Okay, dear. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah you talk to me. Now, second, that's why you see women in menopause, women of 65, 60 years old, they go to the park and they're walking, right? They're walking like this, right? Yes or no? They walk approximately yes. one, one mile a day. Why is that? Because they are doing exercises, making with the muscles, pulling the bones, and that make or promote the deposit of calcium in the bones preventing the osteoporosis, weakening of the bones, okay? All right, so that is the osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are going to bring in calcium, bring in calcium, bring into the what? Into bones. And the osteoclasts are going to take out calcium from the bones. Okay, so osteoblasts are going to bring in calcium from the blood to the bones. Again, osteoblasts are the one who make deposit of calcium in the bones. Okay, and that, that calcium is coming from where? From the blood. So osteoblasts are going to take that calcium from the blood and put it into the bones. Bring into the bones, okay? Osteoclast is going to do the opposite. It's going to take calcium from the bones and put it into the bloodstream. Why is doing that? Remember this chart? Remember this? Right? When it's needed, when the calcium is low, they are going to remove calcium from the, from the bones and put it back into the blood in order to reach the 8.5 to 10 milligrams per deciliter. We okay with that? Yep. And the osteocyte. Osteocyte is a mature osteoblast. It's a mature osteoblast. What is the function of the osteocyte? The osteocyte, the function is to repair and maintain the bones. So we have three cells on the on the bones: osteoblast, osteoclast, and osteocyte. Osteoblast is a young uh, a, a bone cell. Osteocyte is a mature bone cell. Okay, so osteoblast turn into osteocyte. So when they get mature, the osteoblast turns into osteocyte. Osteoblast take calcium from the blood to the bone. And osteocyte 
function is to repair and maintain the bone. Osteoclasts, osteoclast are going to be doing the opposite, the osteoblast. Means taking calcium from the bones and put it into the bloodstream. Okay? Yeah. Got it. All right, so two, two. All right, so I pass it two minutes. So our uh, our next meeting is going to be Wednesday. You know that? Why why is that? Memorial Day. Yeah, Memorial Day. Memorial Day is the May 30. It's Monday. So I will not see you until, let's see. Uh, I will see you Tuesday for Super Tuesday for next quiz. You okay with that? Is that okay? Now, you know, guys, if you have any question, any doubt, you can text me, you can call me, or you can email me. You have all, all the all the all the tools that we have for communication if you need something for me please contact me you know that i'm very fast answering text messages i'm very text person right i'm very text email take me a little bit time because i don't check my my email 10 times a day probably two or one time a day when i am uh, in, during the weekends but if you text me it's almost immediately you can tell Right, so you in the past probably contact me. I answer as soon as, soon as I can. Okay, guys. So that's all. So tell me, please, uh, Erin, how was the class today? Your comments. What do you learn? How do you feel? Are you happy? What do you have? There is something I can improve or do better. Erin, your microphone is off. Okay, you might go. Okay, so same thing, Mallory, please. You call on me? Yes. How, oh, how sorry. You, your impression about the, the, the lecture today? Um, I, I like the lecture today. Um, as always, I like how you um, explain everything throughout the lecture. Um, but for the, for the, like, diseases and stuff so it is a, a bit much but i can de definitely just learn that yeah. like throughout the long weekend that part that part for you guys probably for all of you is uh for most of you are going to be new so that new actually i want you to to have them you, you need to set your mind i love the material said i love the material because if you say oh my god i'm lazy it's so hard i if you put some negative thoughts, it's going to be much more difficult to, to get it. So go over and over and over. Repetition is the best. Yes, Erin, I know your microphone is not working. That's okay. Okay, Miss Mallory, but if you have anything to improve the lecture or to do better, please let me know. Okay? Marcel. Um, everything was good today. Um, Contrary to Maryland, I actually really like the diseases or the bacteria because yeah. um, I just see the applications of like everything we're learning. Yeah, everybody has his favorites. I know. Uh, Mr. Daniel, thank you, Mar Marcel. Um, everything was good. I, I liked a lot of the the ulnar under cheat trick. Um, yeah. How I learned the vertebrae, which stuck with me, though, is breakfast, lunch, dinner for your numbers, 7, 12, and 5. Oh, 7, 12, and 5. Oh, that's good. That's good. And uh, See, everybody, I'm going to use, can I use that, uh, Daniel, for Absolutely. the future? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That, I like that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if um, anything else, yes, Maria, Maria, Marcel. Um, our homework for next week's not due until uh, Wednesday. Yes. Excellent. Okay, guys, that's all for today. I hope you enjoy as much as I enjoy this class. And uh, I will see you for the, our next February topic. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it, Dr. G. Thanks, Dr. G. Thank you. 
are going to stay until somebody you somebody want to say something yeah no i appreciate you responding to me dr g about next wednesday thank you no worry i i totally understand and i with you guy i appreciate okay. it thank you okay, i will again. see you next time sounds good take care bye bye you too.